Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion following the screening of Try Harder. My name is Joanne Parsant. I am the Director of Education for the California Film Institute. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am a white uh, middle-aged woman with round dark rimmed glasses and short light brown curly hair, wearing a white t-shirt and a grayish cardigan, um, sitting in a home office with a bookshelf on one side of me and a printer and a vase of flowers on the other. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of our special guests um, to join us for this conversation. Um, let's start out with the film's director, Debbie Lum, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm the director and producer of Try Harder. I am a middle-aged Chinese American woman, um, have long black hair with a lot of white in it. And I'm talking to you from my home office with my um, younger kids, um, hopefully not interrupting us. <laughs> but perfectly fine if they do. Um, and then uh, two of the Lowell High School students who were featured in the film, uh, let's start out with Sophia. Hi everyone, I'm Sophia. Um, I'm a senior at UCLA and I'm one of the subjects of Try Harder. Um, I am also a Chinese American woman. I'm a senior, so you know roughly how old I am. Um, I am coming to you from uh, my home. We've got like a little nice painting on one side and a little lamp on the other side. And I have long dark brown hair, if that helps. Thanks, Sophia. And Ian Wang. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Wang, and I'm calling you from Atlanta, Georgia right now. Um, I am a college age Asian man, um, sort of long hair, uh, wearing headphones and, um, and, and a wool sweater, along with sweatpants and bourbon stocks, but I'm pretty sure you didn't have to see that. Um, on, on one side, I, I, um, my background has um, a white wall and a couple windows and um, Thanks, Ian. And then two additional guests um, joining us from Redwood High School, uh, student Gabriella Rosenfeld. Gabriella, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Gabriella Rosenfeld. I'm a senior at Redwood High School, and I have medium length brown hair, and I'm in my room right now with my bed and door in the background. Thank you, Gabriella. And career and college specialist from Redwood High School, Becky Beerston. Hi, my name is Becky Bierston. I'm the College and Career Specialist at Redwood High School in Larkspur, California. And um, I have brown hair. I'm, I'm here from my home office with a big map behind me and I'm happy to join you. Thank you so much, everyone. And many thanks also to Jennifer, our ASL interpreter for joining us as well. Greatly appreciate your work and your effort. Um, so just to start off, Debbie, could you just tell us what drew you to make this film about Lowell High School? Um, and how you actually chose the main subjects that you ended up featuring in the film? Yeah, well, I actually started out looking at this from the perspective of being a parent. I have young kids. When I started making the film, my oldest was in kindergarten and I found myself completely surrounded by parents who were already obsessed with trying to get their kids into college at age four. Um, and you know various twists and turns. Um, we were looking at it from this idea of the whole stereotype of tiger mothers. Um, and as I was doing that, I heard about this program at Lowell High School called the Lowell Science Research Program, where you know sophomore, you know, 14, 15 year old and up students in high school were working in graduate level um, research labs um, and you know, these were the kids of those parents um, who were pushing their kids really hard and trying to get into college. And what happened was um, the minute we met the students like Sophia and Ian, um, we just turned course and realized that there was this incredible story about the students themselves. You know, those are the kids that are going through it, going through the college admissions journey, not the parents. Um, and you know, we fell in love with the students and decided to make a film that followed their journey through their senior year at Lowell High School, which of course, as you know, is, is a pretty iconic San Francisco institution. Um, and we just were very lucky that the students, the teachers, the administration, and ultimately the parents welcomed us to tell the story. And we're really grateful about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, we met the students um, a lot of the students we met in their junior year, actually, um, we interviewed hundreds of kids and um, some we met on the first day of filming. I think, you know, I think Ian may have been one of the first students that I met. Um, 
And um, yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, if you've seen the film, they have incredible stories to tell. And we were really looking at diverse perspectives, but all students who were trying to go for um, really top schools. So Sophie and Ian, were you eager to participate in the film or did it take some convincing? Um, Ian, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Like, I, I, I guess for me, I was quite, I was quite frankly, like, kind of surprised that someone was interested in like what I was doing because, like, quite honestly, like, I didn't see myself as too interesting. And um, yeah, so I, I guess like I, I was pretty happy. I was like, wow, so, so someone, so, someone cares about my story. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and along those same lines, um, I don't think I realized what a big deal it was. I think I was just thinking that this is a cool thing that someone happened to be interested enough in Lowell and in the students to want to shoot a film. And at that point, obviously, I didn't have a vision of what the film was going to look like. Um, and so it was very easy to kind of say yes and sign on. And what do you guys think? How do you feel about it now that it's finished? I'm presuming you've both seen it. Yeah, okay. Because um, I, I had that conversation with someone the other day and they're like, oh, I actually haven't seen the film that they were in. Um, but so I'm just curious how you guys feel about the finished film and, and, and how you felt when you first saw it. I can start. Um, definitely was a surprise, um, a good surprise. I think it still takes me by surprise that it has the impact that it does on a lot of people because when it's just you know, a film of you and your friends, it's very easy to see it as just that, whereas it's really not just that. And it's more than that for a lot of people. Um, and so I think I'm really proud of the impact that it's had so far and the fact that somehow my story and my senior year experience resonates with a lot of people is really special. Yeah, um, really, really want to echo what Sophia said. She, she said it really well. And I guess like, just to add, like, it, it's just a really nice trip down memory lane. And I was just really surprised at how, I guess like how much I've changed since then or, and how much I haven't changed since then. Um, it's really eye-opening in, in both respects. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that's most powerful about the film too, is that essentially you said, you know, that what makes my story so special, we're all going through this and it doesn't seem that interesting, but the fact that this is something that, you know, thousands and thousands of students are dealing with all around the country and that they're all thinking the same thing. And I think that's one of the things I know for me that felt like just really, that's why it spoke to me in this, in this context. So Gabrielle, I'm wondering from your perspective, how did the experiences you know, of, of Sophia and Ian and the other Lowell students in the film, how, how did that compare to, how does that compare to your own experiences with the college application process? And how much of that stress and pressure that, that you saw with them is relatable for you and your peers at Redwood? Um, personally, I don't relate too much with their experience, but I know seeing a lot of students at Redwood, a lot of my friends have very similar experiences to them. Um, I'd say overall, there's more diversity in terms of how people approach the college process at my high school versus Lowell, but there are still a lot of students which are, have the same experiences as them. And a lot of my friends, which I know have been dedicating pretty much their life to getting into college. Yeah, Becky, can you talk about how you see that from your perspective in working with students as a college and career specialist? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's such an interesting process when you, when you're asking a 14 or 15 year old student in ninth grade, start think, even thinking about where they want to be and what they want to do when they grow up. And, um, I think for some, you know, we're a very, um, academic school as well. Um, and we definitely have students who are super focused on the most prestigious and, um, competitive schools. And I think, um, when you have that sole vision of only those schools for some, you know, um, ranking kind of reason, it makes the process very stressful and very hard. And I think uh, we have a, high, a higher percentage of students that feel like they're in that category than is probably right when you're looking at a top 10% kind of school. So um, I see both sides of how it can be very stressful for many students. And then, um, students that kind of let go of that a little bit can sort of ease into it and make, make choices that are really great for them without such a burden of stress throughout it. So how much are you saying, I, I would say really for any of you, but how much you think that the, where the pressure, where the greatest stress level is it coming? Is it coming more from, you know, your fellow students, um, from parents, 
Um, you know, we saw a lot of extremes in the film of different parents with different parenting styles. And you were just talking, Debbie, of course, you know, about the tiger mom, you know, stereotype. Um, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, if, 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 well, to start with that, just sort of where you're, where that pressure feels like it's mostly coming from. Um, and, and maybe if you also have recommendations for parents who are watching about how to best support their teens who are going through this process. Ian, do you want to start? Because you smiled at that. You look like you had something you wanted to say. Yeah. So, like, I, I think um, the pressure, the source of pressure is different based on the person, based on like their situation and everything like that. For, for me, the pressure came from myself. And because, like, my family allowed me to, I guess, do whatever I wanted to do. And, and that was both, I guess, ex extremely liberating, but also kind of, I guess, I guess exciting in a bad way, because um, I guess I realized that I, I would have to be a trailblazer and create my own path. And I, I don't know if I'm in a, in the right place to be. I don't I don't, or I don't know if it's my place to recommend um, parents to parent a certain way. But um, I, I think certainly if you have enough resources, just allowing your kid to pursue their interests and and just keeping them curious about the world is incredibly valuable because it, it really paid off for me and my family. And I think it could pay off for so many more. Sophia or Gabriella, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I can hop in. Yeah. Um, definitely. Oh, you can go ahead. Thanks, Gabriella. <laughs> um, definitely really agree with what Ian said about, you know, as a parent, what you can do to help your kids. Um, I would say, you know, my parents definitely raised me with the intention of sending me to a private school, sending me to um, an Ivy League school. And I think that going back to this pressure, where is the pressure coming from? Definitely internal, but it was not placed there by me and it did not come from me, it came from elsewhere, but it ended up becoming an internal stress. Um, and so I would say that, you know, for parents, like don't box your kids into a certain path because often when you do that, there's so much internal strife of, oh, but my parents want me to do this and this is what I think my identity is, but then I'm discovering all these other things I'm passionate about, but I don't know if that's what I really want because this is what I was told my whole life. Um, so, you know, definitely echoing Ian and saying to let your kids explore and to support them in doing that rather than just, you know, putting the tunnel vision goggles on them, I would say. And in my case, I think similar to Ian, a lot of the pressure is coming from myself. I know I have a lot of friends who I think they have other sources of that pressure. For example, I know a lot of people, their parents pay them for getting good grades. For every A, they get a certain amount. Um, they don't allow them to have certain freedoms if they don't get those grades. Uh, fortunately, my family was not like that. I think that it's, I don't know, I think it's really dependent on the people you surround yourself with. I think for some people, it's the pressure comes from themselves, others, their friends, their teachers, their parents. I think it's a combination of everything and just the society and the culture that they're around. I'll, I, I'll add something to that. Mm -hmm. One of the students in our film, Alvin, he would say that it's like a war on two fronts. You know, you have your, your friends at school that are also interested in the same thing. And there's a lot of you know, you, you all are kind of wanting to get good grades and good, good schools, but then you also have the added pressure of your parents. So um, I think, you know, what I saw was there were a lot of pressures on kids. You know, the, you, could, you could try to march to your own drummer and, um, you know, put your own pressure on it, but the pressures, the external pressures are really there. They're already there. They're built into the system. It's not just the parents, it's the way the college industry has evolved over the years with the Common App and kids, you know, feeling like 10 schools is a minimum number of schools that they should be applying to. And maybe 25 to 30 is something that they should consider. I mean, these are all things that, you know, that aren't reasonable, I think, for a young 17, 18 year old trying to just be a high school student. Um, and, um, you know, just anecdotally for all the parents that are out there listening to this, um, I went into it with a lot of curiosity, having kids and wondering like, what does it take to get a kid into college? And something that I noticed was that, um, you know, the kids that really, 
probably performed the best, you know, even by those external metrics, which are somewhat, you know, are very kind of arbitrary in many ways. Um, those kids were often kids that didn't have parental pressure, you know, they were actually just doing it themselves. They had to do it because you can't really force a young adult to do anything that they don't right. want. <laughs> so, you know, that's my little, my little tip for parents. <laughs> well, what, and what would you say, Debbie, as a parent that maybe was the most surprising thing that you learned through this process of making the film? You know, you said your kids, I think, are a little bit younger and aren't yet um, looking at colleges, but, you know, what did you learn for yourself that you would take away from this experience? Oh, so there were so many things that were eye-opening about it, you know, just watching, you know, I, I wasn't invested, they're not my children, but watching them grow up over one year, watching Ian and Sophia, like literally change for my eyes over the course of a year, because I'm not a teacher, you know, um, I'm not used to that. It was amazing to watch um, and the resilience um, and the, the fun that, you know, a, a 17, 18 year old naturally wants to have despite all of the, you know, all of these pressures that are coming down upon them. But on the flip side of that, um, you know, the college application process, even if you know the odds are against you, like Ian said, you know, in the film so eloquently, um, to watch students applying to so many schools, meaning they're gonna be rejected from so many schools, and what that rejection does on the psyche of a young person at such a young age, when the stakes are so high, it's really brutal. I mean, I, you, it makes you really wonder, like really pause about, is that what you wanna put your child through um, during all of this, so. Yeah. So Becky, what can, you know, as far as, you know, your reactions in watching the students in the film, knowing, you know, they're not your students and kind of how, um, you kind of balance that with your, your, your experience at Redwood, you know, sort of what, what, what did you take away from that knowing of what you wished you could have maybe told some of those students or, you know, how you, how you try and guide the students that you work with? Um, well, I think it's, it's sort of twofold. I think it's, you know, part of the competitiveness of these schools is that so many applicants are applying to the same like 25 schools. And so, you know, one piece of, of that that I try and talk to students about is not overvaluing a certain, you know, name because of some ranking and really finding the right match for you. And, and those schools are right for some students and they're really not, you know, they're not a match for everyone. And so to take the time to really do the soul searching about what's right for you and target schools that represent that, that you can, you know, contribute to as a, once you become a student there, as well as what they have to offer you. So that's one piece of it. But one thing that I rem I just really loved from the film was when um, when the teacher, I think the physics teacher was at, it was at Alvin's house and he's talking to his mom and saying, it's not about the best school, it's about what's best for Alvin. And that philosophy I think is just a really good one to just impart to all students. Like, please, you know, don't overvalue. We don't overvalue humans that way. I don't ask my friends where they went to school. And I've seen people with, you know, less prestigious colleges on their resume do amazing things far more than students from, you know, Harvard or Princeton or whatever. And it's kind of what you do with it. So changing that shift in value of where you can make the impact that you want to make and what's the right match for you is something that I try to talk to students about. Yeah, it was so gratifying to see Shay come to that realization in the process of the film too, to hear him talk about how he had to go to this school or he would never be able to accomplish what he needed to do or wanted to do. And then, you know, a, a year, however long later, you know, a few months later, a year later to be like, you know, I, I can I can still do this no matter where I go. And so I'm wondering, Ian and Sophia, you know, you both did, it was just so wonderful to watch you both in the film sort of, you know, just process where you're at, see your stress, but just how well you kind of manage that. And, and just wondering, you know, the choices that you did end up making I mean, obviously now that you're both, you know, seniors um, in college, kind of how you feel about those choices you made, how your college careers are going right now and, and how you were able to kind of embrace that, that feeling of like, this is actually the right choice for me and I'm gonna be totally fine. I can take that. Um, like, I, I, I totally agree with everything that Becky says because like that, that's basically what I had to do. Um, 
I guess early on in my high school career, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to go to like the Harvard, Yale, or Princeton or Stanford's of the world. I, I think I may have said in the film, like, there's no way I'm going to Stanford or something like that. Um, but just like, I guess focusing on fit was just like my, the way that I navigated the whole process. And um, one thing that I did that I don't think many other seniors did was like, I just sat in um, on every single college present, or almost every single college presentation. Um, in um, the school's college and career center. Um, and that helped me get a, like understand what I wanted in a school um, based on what schools were offering. And it, it ultimately led me to Emory where I am now. And I can't say enough great things about this university because of how well it fits me. Um, like the, just the program that I'm in, the resources that are here and the opportunity that, it, that it's allowed me um, after graduation. Um, I'm forever indebted to, I guess, Emory now um, because it's changed my life so much. But um, yeah, I kind of forgot the I kind of, I kind of forgot the second half of the question, um, but I'll I'll leave it at that for uh, Sophia. Yeah, yeah um, in terms of you know kind of dealing with the aftermath of the whole college decision thing, I think that I honestly I definitely remember like being very bummed, um, kind of when you're living your whole life and doing all the things that you're doing with this idea in the back of your head that you're supposed to be going to a certain school and then you don't get into most of the schools that's obviously like a huge um reality check and so when that happened I like definitely did not feel great about that but I think as humans we're just constantly on this like hedonic treadmill right and it just that's fine after two weeks you know what deal with it like roll on life goes on I am so happy with UCLA just as Ian's happy with Emory I think that you know, I could, if I was going to any other school though, I could say the same. I, I could say the same about being happy at Berkeley or I could say the same about being happy anywhere else. But um, yeah, it's just really a matter of what you make of it and your attitude towards your school. I think it's like, if you go into somewhere thinking that you're gonna make the most of it, then you will make the most of it. Um, that's what I've done at UCLA and it's been great. You know, Los Angeles is very fun despite not being able to drive. So <laughs> I've lived with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great to hear. So Gabriella, for you, as you prepare to go, I'm presuming, you know, that you'll be going to college in the fall, it's sort of, you know, how, how is this process, how did it play out for you over the course of the year and, and how do you feel about where you're, where you're headed? Um, well, I definitely had a different going into the process, knowing like last year, or I guess with COVID, I knew that there was going to be more applications. Um, our year didn't require SAT or ACT scores. So I knew that that was going to affect the admissions a lot so I didn't really go in with any expectations and throughout my whole life throughout high school especially I never had one top school so I think that alleviated a lot of pressure and so I wasn't expecting anything so I was just I applied to schools that I would go to these schools I gave myself a variety of reach schools target schools um and I knew going in how difficult it was going to be and how many people are applying and the competitiveness of the schools so I think that I actually personally didn't experience any stress when I was applying. I think now making my decisions is actually harder. Um, I have until next week to decide and I have not made that decision yet. So I've been talking to Becky a lot about this, but yeah, I think that it's pretty independent, but I think that the mindset going in and throughout my life, I think that that's affected my experience a lot. It's a pretty good space to be though, knowing that you have more than one good choice that you could make that you could, you know, and, and after hearing just what Sophie and Ian were saying too, that, you know, wherever you do choose would probably be just as great, you know, if you've committed yourself to that. That's great that you haven't had that much stress. Um, so uh, it, it was interesting to me that many, a lot of students in the film, you know, I don't know if this is just a little thing and they talk about how impressed they are by their fellow students, particularly with, you know, <laughs> Jonathan Chu apparently being like the pinnacle of all. Um, uh, but then they, they often use that as a way to sort of diminish their own self-esteem. I'm wondering if you could just sort of talk a little bit about that dynamic and, and also even Gabrielle, if that's something that you see, if that's an attitude you also see at Redwood, if that's sort of just a consistent thing of that, you know, kind of elevating certain people as a way to sort of diminish your own. But at the, you know, it just, that was such an interesting dynamic. Does anyone want to take that one? <laughs> Ian, you want to I go? mean, I think at my school, like there are certain students that we have expectations for and most people are actually more supportive than you would think at Redwood. Like I have a friend, her top school is Dartmouth 
and my other friend was like oh I don't even want to apply because I want to give her a greater chance of getting in or like she felt guilty applying so that just kind of shows like it's very different from all um I think that obviously there's competition but I think that it's a lot more supportive than what I saw in the film and I think people are going to be disappointed I think like I have a group of friends who all opened one of their acceptances together from the same school which probably wasn't the best idea because obviously the people who don't get are going to be disappointed but also it's really exciting to see your friends get in so I think it's a balance but definitely different from the experiences of the students in the film. Yeah me personally I'm a huge Jonathan Chu fan I, I, I've been a Jonathan <laughs> Chu fan since uh, day one um, back when he came into my registry or homeroom um, for those that don't go to Lowell, um, and he just busted out a Rubik's Cube and gave a pitch as to why he should be our class president while solving the Rubik's Cube. I think uh, Sophia, like, Sophia was also in my reg at the time, so that was pretty amazing, um, and, and, and he's amazing all around, and I think, I, I, think I, I say it many times over the documentary how amazing Jonathan Chu is, because he, he's just, like, that amazing. He's just, like, conventional amazingness, and that really, motiv that, that really motivated me to pursue my own interest, because I realized that I can't solve a Rubik's Cube. I still can't solve a Rubik's Cube. And um, like, I, I, I can't do everything that he does um, because I'd be pushing myself to not play to my own strengths or passions, which is bad. And I think so many people will try to do that and they end up disappointed when they don't get it because like they don't have that element of love that pushes them over, over the edge and really gives them, gives them the advantage and makes their passion a strength. So um, yeah. Still a huge Jonathan Chu fan to this day. Um, he, he's going to do amazing things. Like, I, I promise you, he, he, he's going to be in the news for a good reason in a few years, maybe. So Debbie, I'm curious, actually, given that, like, that, you know, there's so much talk about Jonathan Chu, but you actually really never, there's never Jonathan Chu on screen, you know, telling his own story. Was that um, intentional or did he not want to participate? Oh, we interviewed Jonathan uh, and you nailed it. I mean, what was really interesting to me about it was the way the students at Lowell really thought that Jonathan was a god. And it wasn't just Jonathan. I mean, there were always, there's always a Lowell god every single year. And we've, right. we spoke to them like the year before. And we could see the ones who were the years after. Um, I mean, I don't know. Sophia might have been one of the Lowell goddesses. <laughs> um, and it was, but it really was like that, you know, you'd, you'd walk into a conversation where the kids are like, did you know that Jonathan Chu is also a champion figure skater? <laughs> what could this kid not do? He's also like a concert pianist as well as a concert violinist. Um, so, and of course for the kids at Lowell, because many of them are Asian American, Jonathan Chu is Asian American. And when they're applying to colleges, they really feel like they're being compared to Jonathan Chu. And there's only gonna be one Jonathan Chu that the colleges accept from your school. And I think that is actually often the case for many Asian American students who are applying because there are, there is this, even if it's not the case um, exactly, there is that sense um, that if you're Asian American and you are applying to college and you check that box, that's gonna be a mark against you. And that's a really um, tough position to be in if you're Asian American. It makes kids feel really competitive. And frankly, when I was at Lowell, I mean, what I saw was actually the same thing that Gabriella is talking about. I saw, you know, Rachel was like the one kid who, who learned um, sort of the hard way to like, somebody asked her, where did you get into school? And she told them because most of the kids basically wouldn't say, they didn't wanna, they didn't wanna say where they got in and make somebody else feel bad about it. That was sort of the way that they were, their, their, their ideology was. And I saw that a lot, you know, that, that story about Jonathan Chu saying, oh, um, you know, he, you know, took a zero on a test so that he could lower the curve for everybody else. <laughs> it seemed like, like this great urban legend. Kind of thing. But you know, there are a lot of kids that were like that. Um, and there's a sense of like, it's like boot camp. You know, they kind of all know that they're gonna, um, you know, a good swath of kids know they're gonna fail together. And that that's the together part is, is actually is pretty formative. And I think when you, 
you know, when you think back on high school, that's how it always has been. And that's kind of how it will be. Like, it's a really formative time. So there's going to be these challenges that everybody goes through. And it's kind of going to help define who you are. Yeah. Debbie, can you talk more about the, uh, you know, one of the things I think that is most significant about the film and your approach is, you know, the issue of, you know, the Asian American stereotypes and the specific challenges that students, Asian American students face in the college admissions process. Uh, and I was actually, I was surprised at how very openly and cavalierly it was spoken about, not, you know, by students, by some of the teachers, you know, that slide presentation with the, you know, about the, you know, the racial dynamics. Can you just talk about your filmmaking choices about how you wanted to raise that issue and, and kind of, you know, just at what you hope to reveal in, in approaching it that way? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not, it's not a piece that is, um, sort of looking at the right and wrong of the college admissions process. It's really looking at the impact and what, what happens to students and, and families that are going through it and, and what that journey is gonna be like. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of factors that are probably involved. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be some other films that you know, talk about that, you know, the Varsity Blues, scandal, the Harvard lawsuit, um, all of those things are written about a lot. And I mean, you know, it, kids are being asked to check a box and to really kind of look at themselves through the lens of race. And that's how we do it in America. And these are the results. I mean, like, that's how people, that's what happens to kids. And then you wonder why students have, you know, um, sort of language that's kind of racist. And it's kind of all, it's like in our vocabulary. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, and, um, but it really is like the, the way that it affects your psyche, I think is the thing that I would like people to think about. Um, the, you know, one of the students um, we talked to, who wasn't Asian American thought, you know, how does that feel if you're Asian American and you go to Lowell and there's a seminar, like the one that was presented that we showed in the film. And there's a poster on the wall that says that you're not gonna get in, like, because you're Asian. I mean, it really has an impact. And I did talk to kids who said that, I mean, they like wish they were a different race. And I also talked to kids who basically, you know, didn't want to say, um, you know, that race was a factor. You know, a lot of students have that sort of classic immigrant mentality that really what's a factor is trying harder, you know, put all your effort into it and a, a, dying, a deep belief in the system that the system is gonna, if you work harder, you will be rewarded. And I think we're like at this point in time where none of us are really sure about that, which is what makes it very difficult for students um, nowadays. Yeah. Sophia or Ian, do you want to add anything to that from your perspective? Um, I guess I'll say that when I saw, just thinking about um, Mr. Dickerman, the, one of the physics teachers and his presentation in the class, which you guys saw um, in the film, I thought that was very harsh, but that's kind of the reality of things mm -hmm. that this is just, you know, there, there are these kind of sociological trends that are very clear um, with Asian Americans and, you know, just college admissions and us being one of the highest income like brackets. And it's like, it's very complicated, you know? And I think as a high school student, there's so much that you don't understand. And you're like, why can't I, why, why not? Like, why can't I do that? Um, but you don't understand that there are these odds that are just stacked against you sometimes so yeah yeah well and then so just two months ago the school board the san francisco school board voted to permanently end Lowell's merit-based uh, admissions policy and open it up to the lottery so which would i would imagine you know there the anticipation is that it will change that whole dynamic to some degree i'm wondering how you all feel about that change and what kind of impact you think it will have on future students Um, I think it's, I mean, 
it's an incredibly complicated question, you know, and there's definitely, I can definitely understand the argument on both sides because yeah, it's an equity argument, but yeah, it's also, I think some people are very tied to the idea of lol um, and achievement and that achievement being because of the student body. Um, but I think that the time is right for a change. I think that if anything, this is, you know, 2020 was the right year for that to happen. Um, and obviously at this point, it's too early to, tell like where this is going but um yeah I don't know there's really it's it's difficult to you know say anything about it really because it's like I can I can personally see both sides and I can see why you know some parents would feel very strongly about it but um other people will feel like it's the right decision if anyone else wants to jump in yeah um I, I, I'm really excited for what, what might happen to Lowell because like I I think that the culture of Lowell is really robust um in that everyone's really passionate about academics and just like getting to the next step, maybe a little bit overzealous, but passionate nonetheless. Um, and, and I think the lottery could really, I guess, advance equity because um, like there are a lot of folks um, at, at my middle school or at my K through eight, um, Alice Song Yu, which is covered in uh, Speaking in Tongues, also another great documentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they, they, they barely missed the, um, I guess, point cutoff to get into Lowell. Um, and there are a lot of kids that barely missed the cutoff that, like all that thrive at other high schools, but I think Lowell has so many unique resources that not everyone can get. And I think just making it a lottery adds an element of equity that didn't exist before. But yeah, definitely can see how parents can, and students can be a little bit mad, um, but yeah. What do you think about it, Debbie? I think these two have spoken so eloquently that it is a really complex issue and everyone, I mean, equity is really important. Um, and I have noticed as an outsider, I didn't even, I didn't grow up in San Francisco. I'm from the, I grew up in the Midwest where it's very different, but Lowell High School is such a lightning rod of controversy. It just always has been historically, I think. And so, you know, what's happening now, I feel like it's really, these are issues that all high schools face, actually, and especially in San Francisco Unified. And I, you know, I've, I do think that to some degree Lowell is, um, is, um, I just wonder about the process of it. You know, the, you have to have due process to be able to make changes so that communities and communities should be consulted so that they don't feel like. Um, the rug was pulled out from underneath them. And especially, you know, um, it's a little bit like, um, I, I think the one thing that you have to be cautious about is that it's very much, um, you know, akin to say when Harvard changed their process to holistic admissions where it used to be an exam and, um, you know, many, it, as it turned out, Jewish Americans were being admitted into Harvard back in the 20s and 30s, and the numbers were getting so high that they changed the emissions, emissions policy to be more holistic, so that, you know, you know that that's kind of that was that there's an argument for that, and so, he, I think there's just it, it's you have to kind of look at the talk to the community and see what the community wants and needs. Um, and we have a diverse community. And in San Francisco, you know, at Lowell High School, when we were there, we documented, you know, anti-Black microaggressions that happened to our student, Rachel, who is right. biracial. And African-American students were less than 2% of the student body, which is not how it should be. You know, there should be more representation. Um, and that, you know, really should be addressed from pre-K through eighth grade so that more students would not only get into a school, you know, like take an exam if it, or whatever the qualification, qualifications are to get into Lowell High School, but also choose to go there. And then once they're there, have the support that they need to be able to do well. Um, and that's really a problem that we have in San Francisco, I think, overall. So. Again, sorry, that's a very complex answer. <laughs> no, no, it's like you said, it's a complex question. It's, you know, and, and we have yet to see it all play out. Um, and it's a big shift and there's so many different factors to take into account. Um, and, and I just want to say one more thing because I yeah. feel 
the media, what happens often when you talk about achievement in high school um, and you look at equity, the media tends to pit Asian American students against African American students. It's like, it's not, it's kind of a subtle thing sometimes. It's not intentional, even, but it's in the way in which language is used, um, you know, in a, in a subtle way that kind of show, seems to say, well, if you're going to have an Asian American high school, it's not going to be supportive of Asian, of African American students. And I think that that is a gross stereotype. I mean, I saw for, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, it is difficult for black and brown students at Lowell. Um, there's so much in the minority and, you know, there's a culture in general across high schools where people are insensitive and bullying, especially around race. Um, and it happens to Asian American students as well. And there's definitely something in the culture that tends to not talk about that, not speak about those anti-Asian microaggressions, which are very out there, you know, I mean, in, like we live in a, in, in a part of California that has a very strong Asian American population. And we have, you know, people who can't walk down the street because they're afraid that they're gonna be um, victimized because of their race and their Asian. So I, I do think that these are all things that are happening. Um, and it's just a lot of change needs to happen, you know? Yeah. So just to, we're, we're running long. So just to sort of wrap, I'm wondering what, what each of you would kind of most like viewers to take away from this film, you know, particularly I think other teens who are watching this in our education program and, and our teen wellness program, um, you know, what you would, what you would just like them to take from it and what, you know, from your from your vantage point. Whoever wants to, I don't know if you want to start, Debbie, and then we can. I can begin. Yeah. Um, I think it will depend on like the age, but I think that the mindset that students go into either middle school or high school with, I think that's important. And obviously it's good to have goals for yourself. Um, but you also need to, you know, realize that that society kind of I think is making certain things seem like or like they said in the film like the student he said he felt he couldn't be successful if he didn't go to top college which is just completely false and a lot of people have this mindset they say they look down on people who go to less prestigious college and they idolize people that go to the more prestigious college and also the mindset people have for getting into college and the way that they dedicate their life to like I saw a video with a, a guy had he got cancer. He's like, oh, well, at least now I have a good story to write, so I'll get into a good college. Mm -hmm. That's insane that people are happy about getting cancer just because they know it'll give them an advantage in this process. I think that's insane. And so I think that changing that mindset and obviously it's all, I think it's a business. I think college admissions process, like they want and not just how the society is, is working. So I think that changing his mindset and realizing that those are not the only options and those are the, not the only ways to succeed. Um, it's just crucial. Um, so teaching students that, and obviously at all competitive schools, people are still gonna try to reach for the top, but I think that kind of leveling that and teaching more about other options that aren't just the top, you know, Ivies and top schools like that. I'd like to jump in and say that um, your life doesn't end when you get into a college. Like there's more <laughs> after that. Um, and I think there's so much more to look forward to. And I think when you're in high school, it's very much like you're focused on that and makes sense, but there's still so much beyond that that you can work towards. So it's really not like college is the end all be all. You have so much time after that. And you, I know like saying don't stress about things doesn't help, but you really don't need to stress that hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess two bits of two nuggets. Um, just like do what you love and just be happy where you are. Um, do what you love because I think in many respects, like everything in life is kind of like a competition and that element of just doing what you love will push you over the edge and it'll help you compete. Um, and just be happy where you are. Um, there are a lot of schools that are awfully similar. Like you can't tell me the difference between Tulane and I don't know, 
the University of Miami aside from location. Okay, that, that, may, that may have sounded a little bit mean to both universities, but you sort of get what I'm saying. Like a lot of schools can offer very similar things. And I think that if you're a certain type of person, you'll thrive in most places. And I think people just got to give themselves credit for how robust and adaptable they are because humans are pretty resilient beings. And um, yeah, life, 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 doesn't end in, life doesn't end in college. Like college is a, a gateway to the next big thing. And um, yeah, I'm very excited for the next big thing. And I think everyone should be excited for the next big thing. So yeah. Becky? And I'd like to kind of echo what both Ian and Sophia were talking about, which is, you know, where you go to school doesn't determine your success or your happiness. You get to determine that journey for yourself. Um, I would say applying to college is not a linear process where you can predict if you get a four point, you know, whatever, you're going to get into a certain school. There's so many other um, aspects of development that you should be concentrating on when you're, you know, 15 through 18 years old. I mean, I think you should like get your driver's permit and you should get a summer job and do stuff that teenagers do not so um, heavily focus on building that resume for this impossible dream. And I think that's what makes it hard too for kids who are on that track because that rejection letter from a college might be their first you know, disappointment or rejection at that level that they've had. And that's what makes it so hard to swallow. So if you let yourself try new things and not be the best at them and then try something else, I think that that's really good life lesson that serves not just through high school and the college process, but forever. So Debbie, in addition to telling us what you would like, if you could maybe give us a little update on, on where the film is headed and the kind of um, educational outreach and impact you are aiming to have with it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's they're one in the same. I mean, what I made the film to really give voice to what students go through um, and to really um, share their perspective on what it feels like to be a high school student and to, you know, try to get into a college, try to get into your dream college. And I think, you know, maybe the one thing I'd add is that um, you know, they're going to go and they're going to try and they're going to try really hard. It's, it's sort of like their instinct. And in the end, you know, they are left with their relationships. Um, and they're your, if you're the parent, they're your kids and they're left with that relationship. And that it's that kind of human relationship that's at the center of that um, striving to get into the best college that I would like people to think about. Um, and what we're trying to do beyond um, now that the film is out is really to have a, um, an impact campaign where we recenter students in this college admissions journey and promote uh, mental health and student agency within this diverse ecosystem of college admissions. So we're really um, hoping that people can check it out, check out our website, tryharderfilm.com. And if you go to slash impact, you can see what we're up to. Um, it's very much in sync with what you're doing at Docklands and the teen wellness series. So we're so excited to be part of it. And, um, you know, what Becky and Gabrielle are saying just really resonates so much with what, what we would like to do too, and have people think about um, good fit and um, other options, you know, um, and just try to, we'd love for so many people to see our film. So, you know, if you have a community that you think needs to see Try Harder and then um, launch into a really deep discussion with the community about what this whole process means, then we, we, we hope that will happen. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for making the film. Um, really, really great experience watching. And it was just really great having all of you join us. And thank you so much for all of your stories, your input. Um, it's awesome to see where you guys are at, Ian and Sophia at this point. And um, thank you so much for, for your perspectives, Gabriella and Becky, it was a pleasure. Yeah, I just have one more piece of advice I wanna offer. Um, Cause if we're just looking at the academic side. I think that it's so crucial that we're in high school, like leaving yourself time for other things and balance. I know so many students who have um, sacrifice their sleep, sacrifice their social lives, sacrifice so much for this. And in the short term, yes, you might get that gratification of getting in, but I think in the long term, that's going to affect them 
I think that losing these, I they're not completely losing their their teenage years, but they're losing a lot of it. So I think that making sure you're finding time for that balance, definitely push yourself if this is your goal, but don't make it be the only thing that you can do in your life. So that's super important, I think. Definitely. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you all for taking the time. It's been great to talk to you. Thank good you. Good luck with the film. Thank you. And good luck with your college careers and good luck with where you decide to go, Gabriella. Privilege. Yeah. <laughs>